So, welcome viewers. This is not going to be a uh, travel vlog. This is going to be a full history tour of Abu Simbel. And this time, because there aren't 30 pharaohs that built it, it was just one, um, I can actually do like the full history. <laughs> there was a bit of excitement this morning with the uh, scorpion. I know this is technically going to be a history uh, video, but we'll cut to that, show you what happened this morning. I wonder where it's gone. How long has that been in here for? Oh, I've lost it now. Okay, we're gonna put shoes on. Right, um, I'm gonna need you to pass me. Why am I not in our shoes? I'm gonna have to just check everything. Hell. I mean, that's not what I was expecting. All right. This is when I have a 3:30 a.m. Oh, I don't want to get close. He's actually one okay. of the dangerous ones. You gotta get close. Oh my god. Oh, is that I don't know if I got that on camera because I'm scared. That is 100% a uh, death stalker. It's a more mature one than the ones we've seen in Jordan because it's a bit darker coloured. It's not like lime green. Um, it's got that black tip on the end of its tail. Don't want to get too close to it, it might not be 100% dead. I would never squish something like that normally, but under the circumstances, it's, just, you know, it's in the room. I would never, we'd never stand on it outside. No, never. We would just gently get it out. But the problem is, this is such a small space that we can't even like carry it out effectively on anything. And we've got a bus in ten minutes. It's dark. It's so it's dark. Everywhere. So I just, I had to squish it, unfortunately. So yeah, unfortunately, Scorpion had to go. But yeah, that was interesting. It was literally three minutes or less after we woke up, we had the problem. So Abu Simbel is comprised of two rock cut temples um, in the village of Abu Simbel, uh, just off the Sudanese border on the uh, Lake of Nasser here. Um, the first is dedicated to the gods uh, Amun, Ra Harakte and Batar, as well as the deified king himself, uh, Ramesses II. The smaller temple, which you can just see behind me over here, um, is dedicated to Hathor and personified by his most beloved wife, uh, Nefertari. So you remember from our last video, we talked about Ramses II. Um, he was part of the 19th dynasty uh, and therefore uh, the new kingdom. Uh, he was a prolific builder. He carried out a number of constructions of both, across both Egypt and Nubia. Um, Nubia was under Egyptian control at the time and it was an important source of gold uh, and other trade resources and so Ramses II wanted to impress upon the Nubians Egypt's wealth and power, as well as sort of uh, Egyptianize them, if you will. It was placed here to make an impact on those Nubians. So the great temple of Abu Simbel took about 20 years to build, and it was completed in 1264. It's considered to be one of the most magnificent and beautiful temples that he constructed, well, probably the most. And inside you'll see a lot of sculptures dedicated to his heroic leadership at the Battle of Kadesh. Now, if we cast our memories back to the previous videos I've done, you'll remember that um, when Akhenaten was in charge, when he was the pharaoh, he sort of neglected uh, foreign relationships and they lost land. And so a lot of um, Seti I and Ramses II's reign uh, is sort of um, remembered for the re-establishment of those territories through the battles they had with the Hittites. And so within the temple you can see a number of structures, a number of sculptures dedicated um, to these victories uh, over the Hittites. So the single entrance here is flanked by four 20 meter colossal statues of Ramses II. Uh, and you can see he's got the double crown uh, for Upper and Lower Egypt. One of them, as you can see this one over here, has been broken. What happened was there was an earthquake and the head fell off. Um, and rather than put it back, they've left the head uh, where they originally found it. Now next to his legs, you'll notice there are some smaller statues. Um, and these are dedicated to Nefertari, his uh, queen, his wife, the queen mother, and also his two first sons and his two 
first six daughters, sorry, and his first six daughters. Yeah, some other features are behind the facade, 33 meters up there, is a frieze that depicts 22 baboons. And they've got their hands held up and they're worshiping at the rising sun. Uh, you'll, you'll also see in the center here, there's sort of a sculpture uh, that's sort of built back further into the, into the stone there. And, and that depicts Ramses II actually himself on either side, worshipping the god um, uh, Ra Horakte. And in his hands are several items, uh, and those items are actually kind of a cryptogram for Ramses himself, Ramses II's throne name, Yuza Matre. So now we're entering the temple itself um, and it has a sort of typical um, construction of an Egyptian temple in that it has a kind of a triangular layout. Uh, the rooms slowly get smaller um, as you sort of progress through the temple. Unusually though, uh, this temple has a number of uh, side rooms uh, and is quite complex. So we're just walking around the hippo style hall now. Uh, it's 18 by 17 meters wide uh, with eight pillars depicting Ramses linked to the god uh, Osiris and I'll read to you uh, what that god is of. It's the god of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life and vegetation. Um, and the idea of associating him with Osiris was to demonstrate that idea of having an everlasting pharaoh. On the one side we have uh, Ramses wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt. And then on this right hand side we have Ramses wearing the double crown of both Upper and Lower Egypt. So these bas reliefs uh, depict the military campaigns uh, that Ramses II waged, uh, in particular uh, that Battle of Kadesh. The most famous of these is this chariot rider, uh, and this depicts him shooting arrows, oh, dodging so many tourists here. This depicts him shooting arrows uh, at his fleeing uh, enemies. It's just absolutely rammed in here. So we're just entering the second hall now. So the sanctuary here on the back wall has four rock cut sculptures. Twice a year, the sun shines through the temple onto the four statues, except it doesn't ever reach Ptah because he's the god of the underworld, so he's never shone a light. And they're not exactly sure why it's those two dates that twice a year. Perhaps uh, his birthday or his coronation. Um, so yeah, here we have these four gods. A, a moon, obviously the one with the uh, ostrich plumed hat. And then we have Ramses II, Ptah, um, and Raharakte. The problem with this place is all our other historical videos we've gotten there like super early in the morning. Whereas this one is a three hour trip down here on a bus from Hasbro and obviously all the buses arrive at the same time. Um, not ideal. But anyway look, continuing with the tour now, um, we're going to head towards the other temple uh, down here known as the small temple whereas that's the great temple and this small temple is dedicated to Nefertari uh, well I should say uh, Hathor uh, personified by Nefertari um, who was Ramses II's most beloved wife which tells you everything you need to know about um, <laughs> uh, gender <laughs> equality at the time <laughs> as you'll see in a moment at this temple uh, she's actually displayed um, as a statue is the same size as he is and that's incredibly rare um, 
in Egyptian artwork, you never see that. They're normally always below the knee, similar to how um, his children and uh, you know his wife are portrayed over at the Great Temple. Whereas this one, they're equal in height. And so, in some respects, it says you know how much you know he obviously had respect for um, Nefertari, his wife. Each side is Nefertari, um, flanked by uh, her husband. Ramses II. Uh, again, around the bottom, you see the smaller statues, Nefertari and Ramses II's sons and daughters. Uh, and this one has a slightly, um, shall we say, softer kind of feel to it. It does depict some of his uh, battles in the north and south, but mainly it's about um, dedication to Hathor. So you'll see a lot of Nefertari and Ramses II, you know, making those offerings uh, to Hathor. Uh, again, though, you can see that double crown of the upper and lower Egypt. And that's, he, that's him saying to the Nubians, you know, reinforcing that image of, you know, we are in charge, we are here, we are wealthy. And that again is again to, to remind you the purpose of these temples was to remind these Nubians uh, and press upon them the power and wealth uh, that the Egyptians had. And again, to, to really kind of turn them or Egyptianize them uh, and turn them into more of kind of a one nation. Um, so that was kind of the approach. And there is symbolism of that as well. I'm sure you're starting to appreciate from the other temple when you see those battles of the Hittites Again, this all plays into that idea of reminding people, you know, of the great heroic, you know, legendary status um, of Ramses II. And again, he became deified as a god himself. Um, so yeah, it all kind of comes together. You kind of begin to understand what we're kind of looking at. Just do a little bit about this outside because no, I've no doubt it's going to be absolute madness in there as well. The hyperstar horn, this temple does not depict uh, Osiris, but instead depicts his wife, um, playing the sistrum together with the gods. Uh, in one scene, Ramses is um, presenting flowers or burning incense as well. So again, you sort of get where I'm coming from. It's a bit of a softer feel. Yeah, and the other thing to notice in this one are the, are the column capitals. Um, and those are like basically the tops of the columns and they have images um, of Hathor. And remember Hathor is, a, is depicted as a cow. So the, the, god, the goddess, a version of her, if you will, the human, humanized version of her, where they have the kind of, you know, the gods that have the animal features, is a woman's form with cow's ears, like little round cow's ears. So she looks a bit like, um, you know, Fiona from Shrek, for example. So we'll look out for that as well. You see she's playing the instrument um, to the gods. Uh, that's probably him. That will be him offering, I think it was that incense, I can't remember. So now we go through these three doors into the vestibule. Very powerful imagery here again of Ramses II uh, with his bow. This is the one where it's actually depicting a battle scene uh, alongside Nefertari, which is quite unusual. So you won't believe this, but the temples, the Great Temple, was lost um, essentially to time. It became disused and it eventually became covered by a sand dune. Um, until in 1813, uh, Johann Burkhardt, our Swiss friend, our Swiss explorer, uh, rediscovered them. Uh, and yeah, if you've watched my Petra video, which is a lot better than this one, you'll recall the story of Johann discovering Petra. Again, it's just one of those incredibly endearing diary passages. Johann discovers this one first. He scales down one of these cliffs. Um, and he's just about to depart when he turns around, just, just as we are now, and spots at the far, head, far end a head poking out. And that's when he discovers the Great Temple. Um, but unfortunately, he can't get into it because it's so covered with sand. 
So he goes back to one of his mates and he talks to Giovanni Belzoni, uh, who traveled to the site. Um, but Belzoni was only able to dig into it as well. So anyway, a few years go by and Belzoni comes back in 1817. And this time he is able to enter the temple. But I mean, what a fantastic story of explorers rediscovering this. And not just that, the same explorers that discovered Petra. I mean, how awesome is that? Amy just pointed out the enormous queue here to get in. But alas, viewers, that is not the end. There is more. <laughs> Fast forward and the Aswan Dam is being built. And so in 1959, an international donations campaign began to save these monuments. Um, they were going to be submerged by the Aswan Dam and the uh, Nasser River. They literally cut them into, uh, on average, 20 size block, 20 ton size blocks, and they lifted them, they pushed them 200 meters further back, and I think it was, yeah, and 65 meters high. So essentially, uh, I'll come over here to show you this. And it was an enormous um, uh, international effort, and it was under the UNESCO banner. Uh, and they brought together archeologists, engineers, um, experts with heavy machinery uh, to together um, save these monuments. And so in reality, we should be somewhere down there. <laughs> but instead, they were lifted up here. They call it the greatest archeological engineering accomplishment of all time, to save these monuments. Um, and they're built into um, essentially an artificial hill here. And now you're probably looking a bit closer, you might be able to see the individual stones uh, around the outside because this was not the original cliff. Amy, did that catch you out? Mm. Did you notice? Well, I saw a sign up there <laughs> saying the original site, but yeah. I didn't really put much thought to it. <laughs> did, 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 did the facade trick you? Yeah. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So here you can see the artificial hill I was talking about, and this is the concrete dome that goes over it. And you can see how much they raise it from up here, from down here to up here. So yeah, I wanted to um, leave you as I did uh, when I did the Petra video um, with a painting. Uh, and this painting was, was painted 20 years um, after uh, Belzoni excavated some of the sand away from it. So even in this painting, there would have been more sand over the Great Temple. But what it does do is, is capture that sense of aura that Belsconi and also um, our friend Johan Burkhardt must have experienced when they came here. Colossal statues, the sand, the rocks, and it gives you the sense of the atmosphere of what it must have been like to travel through the desert in a time where there were no certainties about coming back. In fact, sadly, Johan Burkhardt died only two years later in Cairo um, when he got dysentery. And he was only 32, I believe. Um, yeah, that basically concludes it. It's a bit of a difficult video as well, because not only have we been up, we've only had three hours sleep, and we got attacked by a scorpion. And on top of that, it's now rammed full of tourists and getting hot. We've only been given an hour and a half here, so I've had to do all of this within an hour and a half, which means any stumbles or anything like that, I've had to quickly reshoot. And I've, it's, mean that it's put me under pressure, so I've been talking really quickly the whole time. So this is the uh, hippostyle hall. So in the hyper, in, sorry, so in the hyper, so in the hypostyle hall, but, um, so yeah, not our normal video, but now we're gonna rush back to the bus before they leave us stranded here. Before they leave us stranded here in the bloody desert. Oh, we don't have the garments. We don't have the garment. Anyway, thanks again, guys. It's not over yet, I forgot a thing. Akhenaten, who you remember, is sort of that guy with the uh, sourpuss face and all the statues. Uh, and he's the guy that sort of um, was hated by every priest and wealthy person in Egypt because he started that one god religion. Bit of a rebel. Anyway, as much as a whole card, heart, cold hearted person he is portrayed as, with his, uh, you know, with people worshipping him flat on their faces in the dirt, this temple is the second temple here, uh, this one, Ramsey II, devoted to. Um, devoted to his wife. The first, believe it or not, was Akhenaten. So as much as he's the bad guy in all these stories, Akhenaten was actually the first person to devote a temple to his wife. So Akhenaten had a bit of a soft side, as it turns out. And I'm just gonna get you to get me a photo of me outside of... Uh, the lake? No, well, outside of, uh, you know, Abu Simbel. I wanna get a picture in front of Abu Simbel. 